and they should like people who are different considerably less. Again, some head shakes for the newcomers, if this makes some sense. So very simply, what we do in our typical experiment, and believe me, we'll get to the substance of what I have to talk about in, in about 90 seconds or so, no, maybe two minutes. What, what, the average experiment, people come into our lab, and they think that we're studying personality theory. Uh, we give them a boatload of personality measures. Right in the middle of them, we ask them uh, two relatively simple questions. Please describe the emotions that the thought of your own death arouses in you, and jot down as specifically as you can what you think will happen to you as you physically die, and once you're physically dead. In control conditions, we ask people to think about something negative but not fatal. Root canal at the dentist, paralyzed in a car accident, very bad stuff, but you're still breathing. Right? And then what we do 10 or 15 minutes later, often in what is presented as a completely different experiment in a different room with a different experimenter, is we ask people to make judgments about other individuals who are either similar to or different than them. So for example, in a very early study, we had Christian participants either think about death or something unpleasant, and then we asked them to evaluate other people in the room who appeared very similar, except some reported being Christian and some reported being Jewish. And what we found was that in controlled conditions, people didn't differentiate between the target individuals as a function of religion. They evaluated them equally. However, after a reminder of death, the Christian participants liked Christians a lot more, and they like Jewish people a lot less. And this is not a Christian thing. In Israel, Jewish people ask to think about death like Jewish people more, and Arab people less. Not only do reminders of death influence your attitudes, also influences your behavior. So in a very clever study by a German colleague, uh, it was demonstrated that after a reminder of death, German individuals sat closer to a fellow German and further away from an individual who looked obviously Turkish. Right? In another study, uh, we gave people an opportunity to be physically aggressive towards other people after a reminder of death or a reminder of something unpleasant. And what we found is that when people did not share one's political beliefs, reminders of death exponentially increased physical aggression. We've also demonstrated, excuse me, that you don't need to know that you're thinking about death for these effects to occur. We've done what we call subliminal death crimes, where we blast the word death so fast that you can't even see it on a computer screen. And sure enough, 15 minutes later, you'll hate somebody if they're different. So these are very subtle, uh, not conscious effects. If we interview people in front of a funeral parlor, as opposed to 100 meters to either side, uh, we get the same effects. Um, what's the point? Well, there's now over 350 published studies by independent researchers in 13 countries on five, I think, continents that demonstrate that reminders of death have a potent influence on a wide array of human behaviors. All right, I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to introduce our topic for tonight, which is <laughs> fantasies of flight. All right, long story, but a crazy guy and one of my favorite humans, Dan Ogilvy, uh, wrote an excellent book, Oxford University Press, 2003, called Fantasies of Flight. And it's a very charming book, and who remembers Peter Pan from your youth? And, and um, in this book, what Ogilvy argues is that people in all times and places have always desired to fly. And I had a particularly talented student that I was working with at the time, who now is a graduate student with Dan Ogilvy at Rutgers University, and she was a big comic book fan. And she was like, you know, now that I think about it, all the great comic book heroes, if you're any good, you've got to be able to fly, right? If you just crush a car, that's all right. All right, but the, anyone who is mas macho, you've got to be able to get yourself uh, off the ground. And, and then we did some work, and, and what I mean by that is we did some reading 
And, and what we found was, indeed, uh, there are references to people wanting to fly <coughs> all over Earth from minute one. And, and uh, you can look, I'm not going to pummel you with all of these things, but I listed just a few, you know, gods in ancient Egypt, uh, often had wings, Hebrews had some wings, Hindus had elephants with wings, Chinese folks had flying emperors. Now we're on page three. I love the shamanistic traditions and, and read a lot of books about this. Uh, a lot of shape-shifting bird images in, in shamanistic folklore. And then my favorite is the latest comic book superhero, the Flying Friar. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, anyway, I thought it was a joke. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have done that Belgian Trappist monk beer. I thought that guy had a few too many. Uh, but it, indeed, it's a guy with a little beanie uh, flying around. I, well, what, what's, the, what's the point? Well, the point is, is that uh, according to Dan, and he was familiar with our work and Becker's ideas, he just said, you know what, it, it seems like flying is a, a, a normal, natural human yearning uh, that symbolically or psychologically represents immortality. That it, it is something that just seems to render us momentarily uh, permanent and invincible. And, and I like Ellen Dizanayake. She's a local writer. She lives in Seattle. I don't know if we've run into her lately, Neil, but uh, I like her work a lot and her cake. We had a nice day in her living room uh, talking about these ideas. Uh, and uh, I like the way she, she talks about up and down. And she says being downward directed means physically giving in to the forces of gravity, being inert, striving towards safety. Upward direction, in contrast, suggests the tension associated with getting up, lifting, physically overcoming, making an effort, being proud and adventurous, and in general, escaping the pull of gravity that decrees that states of rest must somehow involve movement down. All right, now, I hope it's fairly evident uh, that all things being equal, even if we just look at our own vernacular, who's ever heard the expression, things are looking up, I have lofty aspirations. All right. it, most things that are alive and thriving are rather upward in their orientation. Dropping dead, you're bringing me down. All right, up, good, down, not so good. All right, so, um, so as crazy as it sounds, we said, all right, let us empirically examine the possibility that the universal human yearning for flight has something to do uh, with concerns about mortality. And I want to tell you just briefly, and then consider the implications thereof, of three studies that we've done in the last few years uh, that we think provide some very provocative preliminary evidence in support of this proposition. All right, study number one, the effects of mortality salience on flying fantasies. This was a very simple hypothesis. If flying represents the defiance of nature and gives us a sense of invincibility and an immortality, then when we remind people of their mortality, uh, they should have a greater desire to fly. Now, again, I know I'm being relentlessly annoying, but, but does that make sense? It's a straightforward empirical prediction. And so that's what we did. We randomly divided a group of uh, participants into two groups. We asked some to think about dying and some to think about being in pain or taking an exam. And, and then we showed them this little blurb that uh, you can read at your leisure about fantasies and dreams of flying. Uh, and I'll just read a sentence or two. Some people wish that they could fly in their daytime fantasies. They sometimes think about how wonderful it would be to float along with the clouds or rise higher into outer space. And, and we ask people to read that, and then we just ask them, to what extent did you ever fantasize about being able to fly? To what extent have you dreamed about being able to fly? Right now, how attractive is the thought of flying to you? All right, if you turn the page, you can see uh, that uh, in accordance with our hypothesis, 
people reminded of their mortality uh, reported substantially a greater desire to take flight. Uh, for those of you that are statistically and methodologically adroit uh, by conventional standards, these are uh, 